Hello Adagio tribe! Welcome to another video! My name is Alitz Manolo and today I would like to talk to you about five mistakes I have seen piano teachers make, including yours truly. Throughout my piano tutoring experience since roughly 2009, I encountered a fair amount of students with underdeveloped skills and bad habits who were previously taught by other teachers. In some cases, the students had no idea about most basic theory concepts and even know how to read the notes or understand rhythm after more than three years of piano lessons. Before I continue, I would like to, man to mention that this video was not made with the intent to make petty assumptions and accusations towards other colleagues of mine and their overall approach. I was not present and therefore I simply do not have enough information to allow myself to do that, nor would I want to. The reason why I chose to talk about this, however, is because of the various bad habits and specific lazy teaching hacks that I found written in students' books or I was made aware of by the students themselves. To be fair, I am also guilty of committing some of these mistakes along the way until I realize that they do not help the students as much as I believe them to. It did take me a few years to transition from what I knew a piano tutor did to what I believe they ought to do and adopt a more entrepreneurial approach. An approach that was catered to the overall development of the student and not solely around teaching them just how to play the piano. I ran a bunch of experiments throughout the years to find the best teaching style only to realize that maybe squeezing every student through the same prism of learning might not be the ideal way. It finally dawned on me that a teacher's approach to the material they teach they, uh, their way of distilling down information and communicating, their demeanor, and even their focus on theory must depend exclusively on the person they're teaching. Once I established that, I made a few changes that led almost immediately to an increase in engagement, focus, understanding, and satisfaction with most of my students. So without further ado, I would like to share my findings and my opinions with you. So here are the five mistakes I have come across that every teacher and piano player should be aware of. Number one, write the names or finger numbers for every note on the page. A few years back, I was contacted by someone who was looking for a piano tutor for their children. Their teacher of four years was not able to do it anymore. During my first visit, I asked the student to show me what they have been working on at the time when they stopped playing. To my surprise, when they opened their books, I saw the names of every single note written underneath it and every finger number written on top of it. Not surprisingly, both the students were playing way more advanced songs than they should have been. Of course, the notes were written right on top. But that was making their playing incredibly choppy, unskilled, uneven, and just simply incorrect. They also had no idea about basic concepts like time and key signature, majors, minors, basic chords. Here's the thing. Way too often, I have seen piano tutors allow themselves to give the student a little nudge, little cheat sheets here and there from time to time. 
For example, some would write the names of the first notes on the page so that it's easier for the student to find their hand position and play the song. Cute. That might work for kids who have a strong visual memory, but certainly not for those with dominant muscle and audio memory. What such students essentially do is create a finger choreography of sorts, following a map of patterns that they just populate in their minds. When those patterns are easy enough, they can recreate it in a matter of a few tries, like in the instances with early levels. But that does not, I repeat, it does not teach them how to read notes. What it does, in my opinion, is give the student a false sense of accomplishment and pride, which allows them to coast through the initial levels with such ease. However, when they reach a point where patterns become trickier and they're faced with now a more complex theory in later levels, they hit a level of stagnation which turns their drive off and often results in them quitting altogether. Every student is completely different, so it is really up to the teacher, in my opinion, to find their strengths and their weaknesses and focus on their weaknesses. Through exercises, repetition, and yes, making the student do a few frustrating tasks, like, I don't know, name every single note the first time they play the song. If they do that, the teacher can have an incredible impact on their development. This is especially true if the teacher also works on making their approach more inclusive and focuses on growth. The second problem is to play the song for the student before they begin to learn it. Many students have told me that their previous teachers used to play the songs before to show them what they're supposed to sound like. And I have always been suspicious of this method, mainly because the majority of these students also showed difficulty sight reading and understanding basic theory concepts. Now, don't get me wrong, every student is different. And for those with impeccable sight reading ability, this method might be okay. I still wouldn't recommend it, but it's okay. However, as I argued in the previous point, many students rely on muscle memory. In other words, instead of reading the notes, they memorize the finger patterns. Often such students are also very likely to have a ridiculously strong audio memory. And as a result, what they prefer to do is go faster and restart the song from the beginning every time they make a mistake. This allows them to create and piece the song together one small pattern at a time and learn the song by listening to the melody and not by reading the notes. It's kind of neat if you actually think about it. If the purpose is to teach the student a song fast, then playing it in advance will give them a blueprint and help them double check it when they're not correct. You can do that if they have to get ready quickly for a recital, performance, exam, you name it. However, if the purpose is to improve the student's ability to sight read, create independence, enhance their problem-solving skills, then playing the song for them will not help. As I mentioned before, what it does is make them feel good about learning the song quickly. However, that will not provide them with the tools to be able to tackle more complex musical pieces and patterns and will most likely result in their confidence plummeting in later levels and then, as I mentioned, quit altogether. Now, does that mean that you should never play a song for the student? Oh, of course not. Hearing a flawless version of the musical piece is a must when they enter phase two of the learning process. If you want to learn more about the learning process, follow the link down below to the video on how to perfect the song faster. By playing the song, you let them hear the dynamics, the phrases, 
the whole picture and in many instances it motivates them to be better. However, that has to happen only after they have shown a full understanding of the melody and rhythm and can play the song fairly steady at a slow pace. Number three, hold every student to the same standard. When I started teaching, I fell back on my past experiences with my tutors and drew from their methods. I held all my students up to the same standard. I expected everyone to practice every day. And as for those who didn't, I thought it was due to laziness. I kept insisting on getting each song to recital quality. <laughs> and even after the student had lost interest in it and just so many more. I realized along the way that something wasn't right when I started noticing that students' attention faltered when I was most demanding. I had become a product of my Eastern European musical tutoring, which was no rainbows and sunshine, I can assure you. It was results-driven instead of focusing on personal growth. It was intimidating instead of inclusive. It focused on striving for excellence as opposed to learning from and embracing one's mistakes. I saw that my student's success was linked directly to their satisfaction. No surprise there. And that it varied from student to student. I also started noticing how differently their brains worked from how they absorbed information to how they express their own learning styles. Because of that, I made an effort to enter into a unique kind of partnership with every single student of mine and embrace their uniqueness no matter how old they were. I now use various strategies for every student and as a result, I have better communication and trust with them and they're way more likely to practice and follow my instructions. For example, for those who lose interest after a few minutes of practicing, we focus on doing the hard bits during our lessons and then devise a plan to practice daily for a short period of time. For those who refuse to practice altogether, we split the lessons into smaller ones scattered all over the week and we work each day on learning the songs a few measures at a time and of course for those with strong concentration levels and motivation we focus on creating a routine that will develop every skill in a parallel fashion and propel them to excellence I'm a loud supporter of adopting an individual approach with every student. Understanding their personalities, abilities, skills, and providing a safe place where they can learn to embrace their mistakes and learn from them is the best gift a teacher can leave behind, in my opinion. Mistake number four, rushing students through the learning process. It seems like a simple enough idea, but you'll be surprised to know how many of us lose track of our patience when we see students not paying attention at all or are just being silly. When I started teaching, I found it hard to maintain my cool when I knew that a student is perfectly capable of handling a specific task, but are completely sabotaging the process. I also noticed that the more demanding I became, the more they lacked focus. Their reactions were all too familiar to me and I knew that I had to change my whole demeanor and my tactic because I saw myself in them. So, I stopped rushing them. Instead of telling them what to do, I made suggestions. Instead of counting the beats out loud while they were playing and intimidating them in the process, I asked them what they thought was wrong after they finished playing and how we can fix it. 
instead of asserting authority, I made them know that we are partners and are figuring it out together as a team, no matter how young they were. When I was younger, almost every single piano tutor of mine exhibited impatience during our lessons. They would become more assertive, make tapping noises with the pencil on the page to get me to play a note faster, which never worked really. They raised their voices and even go as far as pushing my finger aggressively on the piano when I wasn't moving fast enough. Now, to be fair, I wasn't a phenomenal student by any means, something I discovered later in life to be attributed to having ADHD. I just didn't know it at the time. It wasn't until I was in high school and switched teachers yet again that I discovered the influence a compassionate, caring, and loving and patient tutor can have on a student. For the first time, I was given a safe space to try and figure out a specific hard part on my own without constant inputs and interruptions and demands. With her, I was allowed to fail and try again. She understood my struggles. We spoke about them openly and non-judgmentally. And as a result, I wanted to do better. I wanted to not let her and myself down and I showed up more prepared every time. After I changed my tactics and gave my students more space and time to figure things out, with me being more of a guidance rather than an authoritative voice, I noticed a positive change in their outputs. The change was substantial in some instances, especially with the children who had a hard time previously focusing and following instructions. As teachers, we all have agendas and checklists with items that need to be taught during a specific class. I get that. I do, however, want to propose to make this checklist more of a fluid suggestions of sorts, a list of items we would like to accomplish without making it a necessity. If there is anything I can encourage is to listen, listen to your students, give them space, even if that means that they spend a third of the class figuring out two lines of the song. Be there to navigate them, to gently push them through the pitfalls and teach them to recognize and savor the minor wins. And who knows, you just might find yourself pleasantly surprised with the results. Number five, make teaching how to learn songs the main goal. It took me a long time, a long, long time before I realized that the main goal of our lessons was not to teach my student how to play the song. It is rather a process that was far more complex than that. It is helping them figure out their strengths and their weaknesses, helping them figure out ways to help them work through those weaknesses, providing them a safe space where the student can embrace their failures and learn from their mistakes, showing them the importance of project management and teaching them just how to break down information so that they do not overwhelm themselves and they can then take that skill and apply it to other parts of their lives. Providing them with space where they can learn to be curious about the way they learn and how their brain works and how they distill information. Helping them figure out strategies to tackle unpleasant tasks and make them more manageable. The reality is that everyone who has basic knowledge in music and piano will be able to learn a song, depending on the level of complexity, of course. But I believe that with enough practicing and drilling, everyone can figure it out, more or less. In addition to that thought, very rarely do students remember songs they have played in previous levels. The question then becomes, 
Why are we so focused on drilling every song to perfection? Could it be that there is a higher goal behind the process of learning songs after songs? Maybe. Instead of preparing students to be recital-ready with every piece, the focus should be on their overall development, like their self-confidence, their independence, their concentration, analytical thinking, creativity, and so many more. Those who want to learn music well and play competitively and show the skills to do that can easily be taught that way. The majority of people who play piano, however, do not want to reach the highest level of musical education. They want to become musically literate and access the wonderful benefits for the brain that playing a musical instrument provides you with. So maybe, just maybe, focusing on overall development throughout learning music might just reap higher results for that specific group. I know it has been the case in my 10 plus years of teaching experience. Some might say that focusing on perfecting a song will do exactly that. I will argue that focusing on the overall development requires a certain form of flexibility that the other method cannot really provide. For example, not everyone will benefit equally from perfecting all scales, arpeggios, and other drills. That will be especially true if exerting pressure to perfect them and play them might create a severe dissatisfaction with the instrument and lead them to quitting, something I have seen way too often. And if that's the case, well, it will defeat the purpose entirely. To finalize everything I said with just a few words, it would be to be flexible, be compassionate, be understanding, and never cease to question and evolve your methods. I hope you find this useful. Good luck. Thank you all for watching. I really hope you found this video helpful. Feel free to drop me a line or leave me a comment below if you have a request or you want to add something or if you just happen to not agree with something I said. I am always, always open for suggestions. Be safe everyone, be healthy and be kind to one another. Love you all. See you all next time.